What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be alive? Is it simply a heartbeat and breathing, or is it something more? Is it feelings of emotions and desires and the pains that come along with certain things being outside of one's reach? Is humanity contingent upon a short lifespan? Would a human being who found a way to immortality maintain their humanity, or would a being created in a lab that has a heartbeat, a short lifespan, and the ability to feel emotions be a human? These are the questions that are asked in 1982's Blade Runner and the book it was based upon, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? My name is Cole. I like movies. Let's talk. Blade Runner came out in 1982 and like I said, is based on the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. I will wholeheartedly say that I think the book has a better title and is probably better overall than the movie. Though, this is almost always the case, especially when adapting such a prolific writer's work. I love Philip K. Dick. I'm really only bringing this up to state two things right off from the jump. One, I will be discussing the movie alone and not comparing it to the book. For the sake of the video, there is only one tale. I also just want to let you know that if you are at all a reader, you should definitely read some Philip K. Dick as he's one of my favorite science fiction authors of all time and it's genuinely not close. If you're a sci-fi fan as well, let me know who you like below. Back to the movie though. I should also note that this video will be discussing the version of the film called The Final Cut. Cut. Seven different edits of the film have been done, with there being a theatrical, international, director's cut, and finally this version, the final cut, which I suspect will one day get changed yet again when Ridley finds some AI that can fix up a bad take or some weird footage. Here is the world of Blade Runner in a nutshell. The year is 2019. Humans have messed up the planet and it's overcrowded, which has resulted in many people beginning to migrate out to space to live off-world. A company called the Tyrell Corporation has invented synthetic life called replicants that think for themselves, have physical bodies in every sense of the word, including hearts, lungs, eyes, etc. These were used as servants and made to do horrible jobs and tasks. The problem is that they feel, thus making them utterly hate their lives and existences, causing many uprisings to occur. There are newer models, which are the sixth generation and are extremely advanced. Because of the violence caused by some of the replicants, they have been banned from Earth itself and are only permitted to be used in the off-world colonies. Whenever some break free from their masters in space and make their way down to Earth, a special police unit type called Blade Runners are employed to kill them, which they refer to as retirement. A group of replicants led by a sixth generation combat unit escape the off-world and make their way down to the planet. Deckard, a Blade Runner who desperately wants to quit his job is called to retire them after the second best Blade Runner in the force is killed by one. He doesn't want to, but is made to understand that he ultimately has no choice in the matter after the commissioner tells him, you know the score, pal. You're not cop, you're little people. You don't want to be a second class citizen in this world in which youths run the streets, scrapping cars, and housing shortages are abundant. Thus, Deckard begrudgingly agrees. Deckard's mission begins with him going to see Tyrell and run his Voight Conf test on a replicant that they have at their facility. The machine used in the test measures bodily functions such as respiration, heart rate, blushing, and pupillary dilation in response to emotionally provocative questions. Essentially, the Blade Runner asks a series of questions designed to trigger an emotional response, and the machine will determine if the person in question is reacting like a human would. There is a young woman who works for Tyrell. Tyrell says that he wants to see the machine have a negative response before he provides it a positive, so he has her, Rachel, take the first test. After around 100 questions, Tyrell asks Rachel to leave the room for a while. Decker declares her a replicant, which Tyrell agrees to, stating she is a new model and a bit of an experiment where they have implanted false memories in her so that it will create a cushion or pillow for their emotions so that they may better control them. Rachel has no idea that she is a replicant. Rachel soon discovers that she is indeed a replicant, or at least the Tyrell has told Deckard she is. She leaves the Tyrell Corporation headquarters and goes to Deckard's apartment to discuss this with him. She tells him of the memory she has, showing him a picture of her and her mother when she was a small child. Deckard responds by telling her of memories that she has, which she has told nobody about. How would Deckard know them if Tyrell hadn't told them to Deckard, and if Rachel had never told anybody about them? How would Tyrell know? This proves to Rachel that she is a replicant, which makes her feel quite sad and Deckard feels bad, trying to pretend he was just joking with her and offering her a drink to calm her down. However, she leaves. This begins to beg the question that is the central theme of the film. What makes a human? What does it mean to be alive? Rachel thinks, feels, hopes, and believes that she is indeed a person. She has needs and desires. She has memories of her childhood and has hopes for what her future will bring. She does not see the world in ones and zeros. She has synthetic human eyes, a synthetic human brain, and every other body part of a human. The only thing that ultimately separates her from an actual human is that she was created by a man in a lab rather than a deity in the sky. Does that mean she is not a human? Does that mean she is not alive? 
alive. Theologians and philosophers could debate this very question until the end of time. I'm trying to tell you about the themes and the core things within the film while not giving too much away, but I'm sure some of it could be considered spoilers. It's a tightrope I'm walking, but I am trying to, just as you should be trying to. Click that like button and subscribe. The replicants that have come to Earth who Deckard must retired have come to solve a major problem they face. See, there was a bit of a fail-safe placed into their DNA or programming, which is that they only live for four short years. This is because they really start to feel their new emotions and formulate their own after a few years. Having them live longer than four years would really put the world in danger as they are hyper-intelligent and beyond strong. Their leader, Batty, aims to find a way to extend their lifespan. He thinks, he feels, he wants and is willing to fight for his own survival while being forced to live with the regrets and the demons of his own past. When you listen to any of the speeches he gives, it connects you on a human level. This is undeniable and irrefutable. Is he not alive? Blade Runner is an incredible film in so many ways. Let's take a brief moment to give all of these their due flowers. The cinematography on the film is amazing. The color choices are precise and make the world feel completely its own. It almost has a noir aesthetic as there are lots of shadows and cool colors. There are so many blue hues in the film and that's a great choice as it tells us, the audience, that the world is cold and harsh. The director of photography was Jordan Cronenworth, who was also the DP on Rolling Thunder, Cutter's Way, Peggy Sue Got Married, and many more films. The score of this this film is absolutely perfect. There is an ambiance and a vibe that is constantly created throughout the film that absolutely sets the tone to perfection. An amazing score is really necessary in this film as well as the film is slow and deliberate in its pace. It does not constantly fill scenes with tons of action, excessive dialogue, or a million cuts. Instead, shots are allowed to run somewhat long and give the viewer time to digest what they are seeing and think for themselves. Vangelis did an amazing job with the score to this film, which should come as no surprise as he was also the composer on Chariots of Fire, Antarctica, Bitter Moon, and many others. The film was, of course, directed by the incredible Ridley Scott, and he does a fantastic job of running the show. The acting in this film is genuinely perfect, and he deserves credit for this, even though he was working with a truly perfect cast. For those inexplicably unaware, Ridley Scott also directed Alien, Thelma and Louise, Gladiator, Black Hawk Down, and many, many other incredible movies. He is legitimately comfortably within the top 25 directors of all time. It only seems right to go from discussing the directing to discussing the cast, which is incredible. We have a little known actor named Harrison Ford playing Deckard and absolutely crushing it. Sean Young does a wonderful job of playing Rachel, which would have to be a somewhat difficult role. You have to play a replicant who doesn't know they are a replicant, then come to terms with being a replicant and play the role entirely different from there, but in a subtle way. That would be very difficult. She does great though. Rutger Hauer plays the leader of the Replicant Squad and is absolutely amazing in the film. You cannot look away from him when he is on the screen and every speech he delivers feels huge and full of weight. It's genuinely a shame that he didn't get at least nominated for Best Supporting Actor for this role. Edward James Olmos is also in the movie, though he doesn't really do much of anything other than be creepy and intimidating. We also have the unforgettable M. Emmett Walsh playing the Commissioner and a well done performance coming from Lars Ulrich. I mean, E.B. Farnham. I mean, William Sanderson. Damn, I always do that. I am a sucker for good sci-fi for a number of reasons, but the predominant reason is the opportunity that science fiction has to take a look at humanity and the technology it is in the process of creating or will possibly create and postulate on what they would do with it. It can show us the best of what we can do and also serve as a warning against the horrors that can be created through such technological advancement. Good science fiction is just as much about philosophy as it is about oohs and ahs, and this film is oozing with philosophical questions and discussions. Another the thing I really enjoy about this movie, as well as almost all other science fiction films from the past, is what they get right and wrong about the future. For instance, in this film, it's 2019 and we're already off-worlding and having flying cars. However, people still use payphones, albeit video calling payphones, and have CRT televisions and computer screens, and use physical photos rather than digital. It's just fun to see what people used to assume the future would be like and how right and wrong they were. We don't have flying cars and nobody lives on Mars or the moon quite yet, but what we do have is flat screen televisions, which apparently nobody could even imagine in 1982. Let me finish this by posing a question I want you to answer in the comments below. Elaborate as much as you wish, or not at all. If a replicant were to be manufactured that thought for itself, had all organic parts, had emotions, dreams, hopes, desires, and a deep-rooted desire to survive, would it be alive, even if it was technically made by a person? Note that I'm not asking if it would be a human, I'm asking if it would be alive. Let's discuss.